Race three is finally upon us, and just as the name suggests, this race is a real crusher. Who can guess what the standings will look like after the dust settles from this year's crusher in the tusher? Leadville on Keegan comes in with the target on his back. Keegan Swenson, unbelievable, making it look easy. You'd have to believe that everybody's going to come in gunning for him and trying to figure out how to contain him. But there's still a lot of question marks at this point. You're starting to see some front runners and some surprises. I have to imagine that there's a group of athletes in the back end of the pack that are thinking, wow, what, you know, what's happened? But they also have to be thinking, there's three more races, big opportunities. We're halfway through the Lifetime Grand Prix Series. On tap is the legendary Leadville 100. He just kind of chills all the time. He likes to sunbathe. Yeah, he's a fun guy to have. He gets to come up to Leadville this time. He doesn't get to come to a lot of races just because I fly to most of them. So it's be a fun weekend. It's just like a camping trip in the mountains with a six hour race thrown in. <laughs> Yeah, Colorado Springs is home for me. I've just always stuck around. We have this trail in Colorado Springs called the Chutes, which is very aptly named. You can take like a dirt road climb up, and then it's just this flow trail of single track with some jumps, and you get to go fast. And that's where I really got hooked on mountain biking, I'd say. My whole family's pretty athletic. My grandpa was a professional golfer. He actually won the PGA in 1958. My dad played hockey. Um, my mom played volleyball. Um, and my aunt actually raced mountain bikes. So that's sort of what led me into the racing side of mountain bikes once I was hooked on riding them. I've always been kind of rooted in the outdoors and embracing the mountains. I do a lot of the 14ers around here. We have 58 of them in Colorado. I've hiked 52 of them. And when you're out there, like it's just, there's nothing else in the world that matters. You're like All you're focused on is not falling off, basically. Your goal is just to get to the summit. Um, and I like those sort of challenges where you can just kind of like leave the outside world behind for a bit and you just kind of become one with nature. In a way, I wouldn't say I feel like cycling's a job, but it is a job. It's very structured and being able to just go hike mountains, you get to be a lot more free. I grew up in Washington State and my family has a retail sporting goods store, so bike shop in the summer, ski shop in the winter. I think everyone I knew was some sort of outdoor enthusiast. I got to work on stuff with my hands, like I was in the repair shop waxing skis, tuning bikes, and it was just my life from a very young age. Now that I get to do it as a living in a different way is, is really cool. I feel like there's, it's just always a roller coaster. There's always highs and lows in sport, and especially in my pursuit of professional cycling. I just graduated college, and my plan was to pursue cycling, and Sibeli and I were both on the same factory team. We got a call that we'd been dropped, and we wouldn't have a contract for the next year. Sibeli was multiple national champion at that point. I had multiple top 15s at World Cups, and we were doing really well, at least we thought at the time. I went through like an identity crisis of like, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. We started reaching out to sponsors and we got hundreds of no's. That was super discouraging, but the biggest turning point for us was absolutely Orange Seal saying that they're interested and wanted to support us as a couple and our individual goals. And that's what really fueled it and made us want to keep searching for more. I think we made just enough budget to travel around to these races and nothing more. I'm just really proud to be here. I'm one of the youngest athletes in the Grand Prix. This is the pinnacle of racing in the United States. And, uh, and I'm really fortunate to be part of it. Officially leaving Durango for Leadville. 
All right. You guys drive safe? Yep. We will. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Bye. A little sad to leave home here, but uh, really excited for the weekend. Leadville is a super cool town, the highest city in the United States. Leadville is just so unique. There's so much history. From the beginning, it was all about what we could give, not what we could get. And I told Mary Lee, I said, we're gonna treat our athletes like customers. And she said, no, Kels, we're gonna treat them like family. And wow, <laughs> did that ever light all the candles. It seems even incomprehensible just to ride a bicycle at this altitude. But this year, for the first time, on terrain just like this, not only are they riding bicycles in Leadville, they're racing them. The mine closed in 82. The race started in 1983. That first year, we had 48 people on the starting line and 10 people finish. And I think part of what made it magical is that it started and ended in Leadville. We sold the race series to Lifetime. Lifetime had been a sponsor. Thanks to Lifetime, the word of it got gotten determination of Leadville is around the clock. The race is an out and back, dauntingly steep and long to 12,400 foot Columbine mine. It's so different from all the other events. 12 or 13,000 feet of climbing over 104 miles. This race is a beast. I mean, the record is right under six hours, and we're climbing up to 12,500 feet. You can't ride out of your skin, and you can't, like, do anything too dumb. Because <laughs> if you're at, you know, over 10,000 feet elevation, and it definitely plays a toll. Leadville's hard, no matter how you put it. I think I break it up into somewhat of three different segments. Uh, the Sugarloaf climb and the power line descent at the beginning are kind of, that's the first kind of crux of the race. By the top of Sugarloaf, when you start descending down power line, you will know somewhat of who the top 15 guys that you're fighting with for the rest of the day. So I'd say that's the first main bit, and then the next big part of the race is the Columbine mine climb. That's, it's about an hour long, and it goes up to like 12,400 something feet. It's just a long, steady grind. It literally feels like a different planet, and there's so little air up there that, for me at least, you start to almost get this like claustrophobic feeling, like physiologically, because your body is just not doing what it should do. I think the group will try to get smaller up Columbine, but I don't think anyone's gonna try to make a race-winning move. I think Powerline is where it's gonna really blow up on the way home. That's kind of the last big part of the race. That's where it's kind of won or lost, I think. Once you get over power line on the way back, you either got dropped or you are headed toward winning the race. And it's all about how do I feel? What do I need? How's my bike doing? Before you get to the road climb going back up to Carter Summit and then Boulevard, which Boulevard is not that hard in the big scheme of things, but if you come in with three guys, it's hard. Wherever you make it to on this course tomorrow, this is the race across the sky, and this is Leadville. It is not predictable. It's, I can tell you that. I've been a racer. I've been that person who showed up, and I'm like, shit, do I have my shit together? Am I okay? Am I ready for this race? Is my bag packed? Is it this? Is it this? And what is that? That's very myopic, right? Remember, this is a small community at the end of the day, right? Because there's a tension in town around these races. I'm going to head to meet our canine guy. What guy? Canine unit, bum dog. Oh. There's no parking. Your streets are shut down multiple days in a row. You can't go to Safeway and actually buy something to eat because the shelves are empty. Right, public safety is number one. So that's if, what we're if here it for. Turns into something. It's an IED. He's trained on that's explosives. That's it. That's explosives. it. There's the safety in all those elements of any race. But it's because of you that I'm here. So. Thank you for what you're In the backdrop, did we get this right, did we get that right, is all tied to did we take care of these people in this community as much as we took care of the athletes. Clean bike is good for the soul. 
I like being my own bike mechanic because there's no one else to blame when things go wrong. And it's very frustrating when there is someone to blame mid-race. Somewhat therapeutic. I mean, there's times like tonight that I'd rather just know that my bike was ready to go, which it theoretically is. But um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's a good feeling when things go right and everything works and you trust it. In 2015, when I got that email from the World Tour Director, I thought my entire life ahead of me was road racing. It was something that I did love and was so excited to embark on. I think there's part of you that has to put away the like human caring for others all the time side to be a A-plus winning athlete. When I was in the World Tour, the best description would be to be a machine. If you want to be the best in the world, you have to be on a regimen. You're a team worker, right? I was going to bed, getting 10 hours of sleep, eating certain amounts each day, focused on big training camps and being able to take in that volume. I think when you're in the World Tour, there's not much room for you to think as an individual. After two years in the World Tour, there were so many things I aspired to do, and a lot of my dreams weren't on the bike. I felt like I had to move back to the US and work on making that positive impact, and I took a pay cut to do that, but it's paid off. Road riding is smooth, simple. You can go so far in such a short amount of time. And then going to mountain bike, all of a sudden got to experience these places I had never seen. You know, I got to go into the woods. I didn't get to just get to pass them. And it opened up the world. I found more enjoyment moving to the mountain bike. It's just, it's a little bit slower paced in a way. And there's things to figure out. Technically, very difficult. But as you start to figure these things out, you get to learn again. Weirdly, Leadville's are very straightforward. To be on the podium though, you need to have a good luck day. You need to have some legs that are, you know, more than just a normal everyday training ride. Through here at Copper Mountain, which is I think about 9,700 feet. So basically the same as Leadville. It's nice to stay close to the same altitude you're racing at for me. I mean, uh, some guys like to come in like the day before, and I think for me it's nice to stay high. You just build more red blood cells and it gives your body a chance to adapt to being at the high elevation. Because it takes like a, about three weeks to get ready for it. So if you don't do that, then the best next best scenario is to come like the day before, and that way your body doesn't even have time to realize what's happened. Russell's coming in the day before, which I think maybe be the best for him. He's still at altitude. He's only he's at like 6,000 feet. But there's a difference between six and 10. Starting at 10,000 feet, the Leadville 100 is punctuated by a punishing climb up Columbine, topping out at 12,400 feet. Hopefully riders have had time to catch their breath. It will be hard to do out on course. I grew up in Park City, Utah. Now I live just out in Heber City, so pretty close. So that's home. And I, I love it there, man. And Utah's, Utah's my home. I mean, I've always been competitive, but I think for me it didn't really like take until I started racing bikes. Both my parents are, you know, very active, always outside doing stuff. My dad and I used to go like backcountry skiing right from the house when I was a kid, and you know, he used to ski race and stuff when he was younger and race bikes a bit. I wouldn't say they were like strict parents by any means, but they definitely pushed me to do the best and kind of focus on things. You know, they're like, well, if you want to, if you want to do this, then you should like put everything into it. You know, don't just like half-ass it. I think I took that to heart with bike racing. You know, like this is something I really want to do. And I kind of made that my singular focus all through middle school, high school. That was the only goal. I was like, I want to be a professional bike racer. I don't want to do anything else. This is Willie, also known as Sir Willie on Instagram, and he likes to ride bikes. As soon as we drove into Leadville, you could tell this town is uh, definitely pumped up. Everybody's buzzing. I think everybody's really excited. It'll be a good race tomorrow. 
you can feel the nerves crackling. You know, I think there's some static in the air. Anxious, excited. I've tried for 10 years to get into this. In January, I found out I'm in. I better get a bike. I better learn how to mountain bike. We've seen a lot of the YouTube movies, so like, I mean, it's exactly what we expected. Finishing under 12. 11.59.59 is my podium. I'm She's gonna finish. That's right. Well, we don't know. <laughs> as long as the mountain bike holds up, should be okay, right? Yeah, no, not looking forward to power line, but. <laughs> 330 plus 120 is 450, whatever 450 times six is. Leadville, that's like, we race it as pros and we're here to win, but then there's also these 2,000 other amateurs that are out there. We're kind of all out there on our own little journey, which makes it really cool just to like share stories with everyone, like what happened out there. Like you tell people you ride power line and they just, lose it their minds blown that we're able to ride up that <laughs> but then like they tell us they were out there for 15 hours or whatever and like my mind's blown because that is a long time on a bike i think that's what's pretty special about leadville is just the wide range of experience we're all trying to get out there i don't know this is my first year racing leadville the way that these races have been going this year it seems like everyone just hits it from the start to try to get separation so i mean we could have a like a select group right off the bat up this first climb i mean just looking at the course columbine is massive climbs all the way up to 12.5 it's a long one and then that descent right back down so this is our turnaround point and then we'll be descending while people are climbing it's going to be chaos in a race like this, I try to eat between 80 and 100 grams of carbs an hour, which is a lot of food, but it's super key to keeping energy levels as high as possible. And it's easy to get behind quickly, so you really have to stay on top of it. And half the battle is just having a plan, like down to the gram, what I'm gonna eat, when. It's a big math problem, actually. <laughs> it gets complicated quickly. <laughs> hey, Matt, we might come hang out for the camera pretend like the routine is I just hang out with you while you work on my bike the whole time. <laughs> Personally, I'm feeling great about my fitness. This is what mechanics do. Did you do anything crazy to the bottom bracket this time? Uh, I double checked. Yeah, actually. You know, it was great to get fourth place points at Crusher, but I was super frustrated just because I felt so on fire and had a mechanical and it's kind of like, man, two out of three races, like Miss Sea Otter, have a decent unbound and then have a great thing going for Crusher and then have a puncture. But everyone's had bad luck other than Keegan. Let's be honest, like right now the Grand Prix is a race for second place and every individual race is a race for second place too. But I'm starting to get tired of finishing third and fourth and you know, I, I'd like to do better than that. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, training's been going well, but We'll see what happens tomorrow. You never know. Yeah, just wrapped up breakfast here. All of a sudden you're like, oh no, it's time to get ready. <laughs> Had a good night of sleep, jumped out of bed, stoked to get it going, so yeah, feeling good. Yeah. It's race right morning here in Leadville, getting things ready to rock and roll. There's always a bit of pressure, you know, but I don't think it's any more than any other race. Um, you know, just to show up and do what I do, and that's it. Obviously anybody in the top 10 has a lot to gain by, you know, by being competitive and, and I think we could have somebody that hasn't been so competitive uh, in the series yet really kind of rise at Leadville. While Keegan currently has a stronghold on first place, Russell Finsterwald is now in second. He currently has a two point lead over Alexi Vermillion and I'm sure he wouldn't mind strengthening that lead. Take a second, look around you, notice where you are, notice who you're with. 
work together in those places that you need to. Lots of smiles. Dig deep. Have an awesome time. Here we are in a beautiful, crisp, Rocky Mountain morning in downtown Leadville, Colorado. We're starting at 10,200 feet above sea level, and it only goes up from here. As part of Leadville's storied tradition, the shotgun blast will signal the start. And the riders are off. The race begins with a neutral start as the riders follow lead vehicles out of town on West 6th Street. There's roughly three miles of pavement ahead of them before the fun begins. And as the riders make that turn onto the gravel, the vehicles clear out of the way and the group is off. You gotta have the ability to, to push yourself at altitude, 30% less oxygen than sea level, and to sustain yourself, you know, between, you know, eating and you know, maintaining your heart rate and the energy output. And here we are now starting to make that climb up St. Kevin's. Gears are shifting and power outputs climbing, but the group is still tight together as they make their way up and over Carter Summit. So sitting in front of me in the Grand Prix is Keegan and Russell. Keegan is quite a ways off uh, and Russell's one point ahead of me. So I think it's a race for second, but I don't think it's just between Russell and I. Now the riders turn back onto gravel, making their way to the climb up Sugarloaf. Howie, Payson, Cole. We got a lot of firepower behind us. And it looks like Alexi Vermeulian is already making an attack. Or wait, no, he's pulling over with a mechanical. Let's hope it's nothing serious. Kick it's making a move and he's trying to draft us. Go, go, go. But he's making his move. They're about to turn. As the riders make the turn onto Sugarloaf, you can see Keegan Swenson pulling ahead. Keegan has been a dominating force in this series with full points at every race so far. He won Leadville last year and he's ready to do it again this year. After dropping unbound, Cole Patton is another racer who has a lot on the line. Crusher was a huge race with a strong second place finish. Hopefully he can ride that momentum for a strong performance here in Leadville. I'm riding a new hardtail from Scott, super light. I'm going with two 2.5 tires just because I'm not willing to risk it. Heading down the power line descent, the group is stretched out a little. We still have Swenson, Lachlan Morton, and Finsky out front, with probably 20 riders strung out with two to five seconds in between each. I'll be running a 36 tooth chain ring, but I have a pretty big range in the rear with a 10 by 52 cassette. Hopefully I'll be with the group and can kind of tuck in and, and conserve energy that way, not just motoring to try to set a record or something. As longtime friends and training partners, we can expect to see Russell and Keegan working together as long as possible. Keegan's one of my best friends. We've been racing bikes together since we were 15 or 16 years old. He likes to go out and just smash big rides and we have the same thoughts on racing and training. So yeah, it works out well. And in the races, you know, we kind of like work together sometimes as a team if it works out in our benefit. And then when it comes down to it, we're racing each other. It could be a little frustrating, like you have one of your friends just beating up on you all the time. But yeah, I think like we've definitely helped bring each other's level up. We push each other. If that means I have to finish second to him sometimes, then that's what it means. Back on pavement after the power line descent, the riders are bunching back up again. It doesn't look like anyone's ready to give up those group tactics to make an attack quite yet. You can see them all working together, taking pulls up front and moving back. Here we come to the pipeline aid station. The feeds are coming quickly, but I'm not seeing much slowing down. You know who I'm not seeing in this lead group anymore is Payson or Lachlan. Keegan and Russell still working hard together. Todd Wells, John Gaston, and Matthew Beers hanging in there. It's also good to see Alexi and Cole with the front group. All right, here comes the lead moto. So we're four to five minutes away from the elite riders. 
And here they come into the Twin Lakes aid station. This is mile 40 and that same group of 10 is still tight together, all within four seconds of each other. Coming into the bottom of Columbine, we usually have something like 10 guys dropping down off the top at the turnaround point. It could be three, maybe five. That's where the big, big selection happens. The lead group is getting closer and closer to Columbine, almost in the shadow of the mountain now. This is where the rubber meets the road, the crux of the race and the climb that's made the Leadville 100 famous. Who will be able to hang on the steep 3,000 foot plus climb? This is where those legs and lungs start to burn as the oxygen gets thin. It becomes almost like a slow motion race, like a 10 second gap is an eternity. Like you can see someone 25 yards up the road, but you can't just sprint across the gap because there's just zero oxygen up there. And there's Payson, who seems to be struggling. We hear a mechanical is what held him back early in the race, and he's got his work cut out for him. Part of the gamble we all take when we go on the start line is, is luck on our side today. And here we have our first live look from the top. And no surprises here as it's Keegan Swenson who is separated from the group and is approaching the top of Columbine. And now is when we see the toll that Columbine has taken. At the top, Keegan now has almost a three minute lead on Howard. The whole group is broken apart. Let's go, Howard, yeah! The old man's land. In second is Howard Grotz, followed by Alexi Vermillion. Less than two minutes behind Alexi is Cole Patton and John Gaston, not part of the Grand Prix. It looks like Russell has fallen back to six. The massive Columbine climb brings the group down to just a select handful. Turn around, do it all backwards. Back at the bottom of Columbine, and it looks like no one was able to catch Keegan on the downhill as he comes flying into the aid station below. If someone gets off the front, they have a long, lonely road back of like 40 miles solo. You don't know what's going on behind you, so you just have to keep focused and keep charging. And I'm going to run a 38 tooth chainring, and most guys only use 36s. So I think as long as I can like snap that elastic and separate from the group, then no one's going to catch me if I can spin out the 3810. Back in the flats, Keegan is still holding on to his substantial lead, but behind him, a chase group is bunched up, and it looks like they're pulling and using their combined strength to try and close the gap. There's a little bit of a headwind, so it'll be interesting to see if they can make up any time before they get to power line. If you can create that gap and confident enough you can make it a power line with it, it's game over. And here we go, Keegan starting up power line. This is the last real obstacle that separates him from the finish line. The chase group is doing what they can to close the gap, but somehow Keegan just continues to widen his lead. Unless something goes wrong here, you have to imagine that he's going to cruise to the finish line. The important attack will happen coming back up power line on the way back at like mile 80. And with Keegan up and over, it looks like our chase group is just going to be battling for second at this point. Alexi has a slight lead with Howard, John, and Cole right on his tail. Keegan hit pavement. Working his way up Turquoise Lake Road, his lead is now 12 minutes, and I think he might break six hours. Only time will tell, and what we're gonna do now is we're gonna kinda turn our attention down 6th Street. Uh, we're anticipating Keegan crest the top of 6th Street. So we're gonna see a lead moto. I mean, the series is still, I mean, we're only halfway through and our mindset's still the same as it was at the beginning. Gotta keep racing every race as if it's the only one. I mean, it's not over till it's over, you know? You need to keep charging and just stay on the gas. Making his way down the final stretch, Keegan is all alone. Last year, he won with a time of six hours, 11 minutes and 26 seconds, and he's clearly going to beat it. 
Here he comes right on the money. Keegan has done it again. The media has plenty of time to get all their interviews because it'll be nearly 15 minutes before the next rider crosses. Give it up for Keegan Spencer one more time. The field was definitely more talented this year. We have more depth with the Grand Prix. Uh, so we were rolling faster on the way out. And it looks like John Gaston was going to be able to edge out Howard Grotz for the second place finish. John isn't in the Grand Prix, however, so Howie will get those second place points. Finishing up third in the Grand Prix is Alexi. I couldn't have done much else that race. That's kind of the goal. So, be back next year for sure. I don't know why, but I'll be back. I thought my day was over, but then I saw my teammate Sophia. She gave me her rear wheel, which is like the nicest thing ever. Without her, I definitely like wouldn't have been able to ride back into the top 10. So salvage a little bit of lifetime points. Um, I was hoping for a little more today. With four races down, here are our current standings. Keegan's lead keeps growing with 90 points. Cole Patton has moved up to second place with 82 points. Alexi Vermeulen has 80 points. Russell has dropped from second to fourth, now with 79 points. And a huge congrats to all of the riders on an incredible race. Besides Keegan's first position, the Grand Prix leaderboard is getting interesting with only two races left. We'll see you at Schwamigan.